Hello, everybody, and welcome to a masterclass on games design, and in particular, level design in our games design. My name is Tom Owens. I'm course leader for our games design foundation degree. Um, the degree also comes with a top-up year as well, so you can turn it into a full three-year degree if you want. And today, I'm going to be taking you through level design itself, looking at what it actually is, what goes into it. It's not just about having a good idea. Uh, we'll be looking at a couple of games that have been made with quite interesting level design for the player, looking at how we can actually get some software to start creating our own level designs, and then a few of the skills that go into that level design work. So you'll learn a little bit of software as well in this session. Now, um, there are two sorts of themes we're going to be looking at today, and the first one is that skills development in a piece of software called Unreal Engine. And the second one is understanding a couple of terms to do with level design. So the first term I'm going to mention is called flow. And flow is a term that means the player is in the zone. So if you've ever been playing a, a sports game, if you've ever been in the arcade or working on a puzzle, and you found that your brain sort of closes out the world around you, and it really focuses on a specific task, and you find that you don't have to consciously make the effort to stay focused, that's flow. So if you're playing a computer game, and you know, you're playing a, a 2D platformer, you're playing a 3D shooter, and you are completely immersed, that monitor is the only thing you're focused on, and you're solving problems, you're defeating the bad guys, you're you know, jumping across the gaps with perfect timing, um, that puts you in a state of flow. And then if you, you know, get to the end of the level and you want to continue, you want to keep on going, then you know, we, we call that like the sort of like peak flow that you're in, in the exact spot we want you as a player to be in. Now, just as important as knowing what flow is, is um, knowing what flow isn't. So when we design a game, when we design a level, we want to make a level that does three things. First of all, it teaches the player how to play the game especially important in your first levels. But whenever there's a new feature or a new mechanic introduced, we need to teach the player what that is. Secondly, the game has to provide you with a suitable level of challenge. So if we show you how to do something and then you go and do that thing, it has to be difficult. And then thirdly, the game has to not bore you. So our levels have to be interesting. If you're playing for, you know, a 20 hour game over over a couple of weeks then those 20 hours should feel just as entertaining um as each other it shouldn't get to the point where everything feels rep uh, repetitive or samey you know get to the point where the the challenge is gone etc so that's our sort of three goals teach the player what to do make sure that it's challenging to the player and make sure that um things don't get repetitive or there's always something new on the way in the player's experience so um we're going to dive in and we're going to look at just a couple of games. So if I hop over to main, we're going to look at a game called Super Liminal. So um, if you've seen a very popular GIF going around the internet of a chess piece being moved in a, a funky way, um, you'll recognize Super Liminal. So I've just started a brand new game, hopefully not erase my old save game. And this is our first screen. Okay, so I can move, I can control the player. And you'll see on this wall where we're directed at the second the game starts, we have these controls, W, A, S, D, and the mouse. So you can press those keys. If you're a player who has never played a computer game before, you'll recognize those keys on your keyboard. Press them. Oh, wow, we're moving. And then the same for the mouse. We'll wiggle the mouse left to right. So this seems really straightforward and obvious. If you've played computer games before, same as you know a controller saying right trigger to shoot, analog stick to move. Well, yeah, it's going to be obvious to you. You're going to immediately turn away from this wall and carry on with the game. But to someone who's brand new to a game um, or to video gaming in general, this is a really useful screen, and it takes one second to look at. So... The design of the level, first and foremost, is a blank wall um, with this, this little texture on the wall straight away. Um, and then the player turns around, and they see a very similar room, a similar environment. Now, there's lighting up above. The room is evenly lit. We can see the whole room equally, a little bit of shadow in the corner. And there is nothing else really of note in this room to interact with, except a door has now appeared. So if we walk over here, we'll see a term of service, which we've just signed. Always read the terms of service before you sign them, of course. I'm sure you all do, every phone contract you get. Um, 
And then, yeah, we turn around and see that a door's opened. So this is our first indicator in the level design that the world may not be as it seems. We turn the round. This was a solid wall when we first turned around. And now that we walk through it, it's, um, it's you know, a, a doorway that takes us elsewhere. So using our WASD that we've learned, we walk forward. Again, the corridor is reasonably samey. Um, we come through to this room. Now, there's a light, and this is something important in level design. Um, if you came on the course, you would hear me talking about lighting a lot, maybe too much. But lighting is crucial to informing the player of what they're supposed to do in the level. So you'll see that, again, we don't have our lighting on this ceiling, although we have the same ceiling here. Um, the room is a little darker as a consequence. You can even see the room down there, the original. Um, so this light, this desk light, is emphasized even more so um, because of the darkness in the environment. And it is shining on a piece of paper and four chess pieces. The paper says, perception is reality. Grab with a little arrow pointing at the chess piece. So if we grab our chess piece, we're now holding our chess piece, aren't we clever? And we walk out to here and we go, oh my God, there's a gigantic chess piece. So again, there's nowhere else for the player to look. The player has learned to grab chess pieces as they play the game. And um, we can grab this chess piece, which is gigantic. But when we pick it up, actually, you'll notice it's become a lot smaller. And you'll see if I just drop it there, it's a lot smaller than it once was. So um, again, this is the second hint to the player that the level is not what it seems. Look how small it is now. So the further away we are as we pick a piece up, the smaller it gets. Now it's a tiny, tiny chess piece. So we've learned a few things. Um, we've looked at lighting and how lighting can control a player's perspective in a game. We've looked at how we can use changes in the level to indicate to the player um, what the game is about. So that's, again, teaching the player as we go. And we've put some you know, direct instructions in the game as well to show the player how to use the controls to interact with controls we have space to jump so you'll see on this little sign here again um, it looks incidental it's part of the scenery if it's in but we have space to jump so you jump over then we get into a room where we see all of these puzzle pieces knocking about um chess pieces again which we know we can change the size of we got a little bit of story a little bit of dialogue um and yet we see these blocks so for example this tiny block we can pick up, put in the corner, and it becomes a lot bigger. Now, looking around, we can just move all the pieces. And then we see, revealed from moving the pieces, is a doorway up here. So this is the first stage of our room that I would say is a genuine puzzle. The first couple were just tutorials. That's just showing the player, here's how you navigate, here's how you use your controls. This puzzle actually requires two steps. The first step is for the player to discover the exit to the room. And then the second step is for the player to devise an escape to the room. Now, what a player might first try after moving that first block is to jump on the chess piece and run up, got bounced a bit, and then we can go through the door. That's one way of solving this puzzle. Another way is for the player to actually grab a medium-sized block and place it next to this block, use it as a platform to jump up. So there are two very, very similar solutions, but there's almost like a pre-baked solution and then a solution for the player to discover. But the important part is, you know, moving the block to discover the exit. Again, we get a very, very similar corridor. Um, we get this new section, which is no objects beyond this point. And you'll notice they put this block here um, for no reason other than to teach you a, a lesson to make sure you don't misbehave. So we're not allowed any objects. If we pick the object up, we walk through. Oh, look, we can't actually walk through the door. So it gets stuck. And it's on the other side of the door. We can't pick it up, no matter how much we mouse over it. We'd have to walk back through to pick it up. So um, that's to stop you, you know, sort of like cheating future rooms where you can just bring a bunch of blocks through. So here we are in a new room. This looks a bit different. It's bigger. The lights are back on. We've got mirrors all around us. We don't have a reflection, so we're optimizing our game performance. We're being lazy developers, no reflection. We step on this button, and the door shuts. Okay, So this is a new puzzle where the door shuts. Now, 
we know, and this is a very common game trope, you know, you step on the button, it activates something. But when we step off, we can't get through the door. But the solution to this one now is slightly more complex. The previous solution just involved moving a block. The next solution, the next puzzle, this one, involves standing on a platform to open a door to give us access to a block, which we can then place on the button and go through the door. And that was, you know, that that table. Again, the rooms are very, very sparse, uh, very sparse. There's not much in them. But this table acts as uh, an eye catcher, just like the lamp. Okay, and light's so powerful for, for eye catching. But yeah, this table again draws our attention because you look in the room, there's an exit and there's a table. But from the button, we can't see the exit, just the table. So yeah, that, that's about our view on the button where you see the table. So up to this stage, and, and we'll leave it here into it for um, Superliminal. But this is how like Superliminal's first few levels have been designed. And you've got to remember, as a, as a designer as well, one of your biggest challenges is don't have people turn the game off after five minutes. Don't have people run around in a room, walk into one of these rooms, get stuck and say, oh, this game sucks. I, I can't tell what I'm supposed to do. It doesn't make any sense. I'm not playing. Closing the game. Um, or if they get frustrated and you know, they, they close it, go off to bed, go do something else. Um, when they wake up the next day and they turn on the computer, turn on the console, are they going to want to you know, play this game again. That just caused them frustration that they don't like. Um, um, yeah, this is super liminal. Um, we won't do this next puzzle, but just to look at it, you know, it uses the the um, same principle from the last level where we looked through a doorway gap, and now we actually have, you know, two um, side windows we can look through. One's got a button, one's got a chess piece. So more complexity now, two environments, neither of which is through the exit door, um, and we have to join the dots between these two puzzles. Now, down the line, um, I'll have to say trust me on this, but um, you will find that the puzzles in Superliminal become a lot more complex as time goes on. There's a lot more challenge to them. Um, you eventually leave these rooms and go into a sort of more natural world as well. So then you get you know, sort of ambient um, objects around the room which you have to sort of like work out, you know, are they for something? Are they just decoration? Um, and that's where the game uses lighting and color and positioning to achieve um, its goals in instructing the player what to do. I said I wouldn't solve that, but yeah. Um, that's that for the game. We have a cheese wheel, very exciting. I don't like cheese, so it's not that exciting to me. Um, but yeah, again, same principle, just using the size to do so, um, to solve the puzzle. So we will um, save and quit. And I shall hope that my uh, save game still exists somewhere out there. And um, next, we will launch Portal. And now, Portal is a game that is, I think it was 2004. So it's 17 years old. Superliminal, I think, was 2019, 2018. So that's only a few years old. Portal is about 17 years old. And although it's not the first puzzle game, there are even a lot of Flash puzzle games, and Portal started as a Flash game. Um, Portal is one of like the sort of the, the legends in terms of you know both puzzle games and level design. So if I go to new game, you know we've got all of these levels. Um, if I just start a new game, we'll load. You'll get some very old school sort of like loading bars uh, that you wouldn't really tolerate these days. Um, we, we hop up out of bed, and we start in this room. So, similar to Superliminal, 17 years ago, it does the same thing. On the right-hand side, you'll see it pops up. I'll just move the camera so you can see it clearer. Uh, forward, back, left, right, WASD. And we move forward, back, left, and right. Space to jump. And then we have GLaDOS talking to us, telling us off, and pick the radio up. Um, and then just while this happens, so... Um, You'll see we're in this room and there's dialogue going on. We're actually not able to leave yet because the door is shut. This is just to give the player a couple of seconds to practice the controls, to learn the controls. More experienced players will try pressing E, F, Q on the radio, left click to do things with it, um, to pick objects up, and left click to throw them. And then we have the story, the dialogue, which I'm not going to focus on storytelling for today. Um, we're looking at level design. 
now that the portal is open, you can see us, so we can see the room we're in. And without any control from the player, we see the mechanic of the entire game. Portals, portals that open up. So if I walk through here, and um, we see this screen, which is just a big whiteboard with two icons highlighted and another eight icons not, and zero out of 19. So again, this gives the player an idea of upcoming progress. So now the only place we can walk is around here. We see the camera camera follows us it's very creepy and um, we walk into this room so again the player only has one way they can go and um, we can also see like the cell we were in which you know isn't the most pleasant of places um we come through here and again very very simple room it does not much going on we will look over here the player is not going to look in this corner they'll look over here they'll see the cube drop the player walks onto the button the door opens yay the door's open we can complete the level no you can't so as we get to this door, you'll see it says E to pick up an object on the right-hand side. So something portal does that's not as effective in its design as Superliminal is it just pops like tutorial text up on your screen. It's not very immersive. It doesn't get the player in the zone as much because this is just text flying up on your screen. In Superliminal, they actually embedded those controls into the world that you were in. So, you know, that wet floor sign that said press space to jump. Um and yet the WASD on the wall, that turned into a door. So, Portal, as much as it's a legend, as much as it's an absolutely fantastic game that I recommend anyone play who's interested in level design, um, it definitely you know has some older design practices that have been eclipsed in it. So we get some lore dumps, um, and every Portal level ends with us going through this grill, um, and it's called yet yeah, the Aperture Science Material Emancipation Grid. So it destroys any objects you try to take through. Go into here, we'll get a quick loading screen. Each level is loaded individually. Um, maybe not the tutorial level. I might have told a lie there. Uh, most levels, you'll get a load screen here. And then if we look at a couple more levels at the start of Portal, um, we will see the screen will come to life. So again, this screen could be lit up as we exit the lift already. But flashing to life, it's lighting again. Okay. Um, it's using that flicker of the light coming on to catch our attention. So if we come out the lift and we're looking around this corner, even to here as you get to like a strafe, you'll see this light up, right? It's in our cone of view all the way across. Um, and now we see zero, 01 out of 19, and none of these icons are highlighted, so you'll remember that um, two of these were highlighted initially. Come to this drop. We look around, we see a creepy camera again, and we can see our level. We drop down, a uh, portal opens up, and then we're able to walk through this portal, which we'll see changes. So you'll see this blue portal here has now moved to one of these walls. I wait for it to come back around. You'll see the orange one changes each time with its source, and now it will open up. So we want this cube on this button. Very, very super liminal, so I'll hop through now. Um, just like the chess piece and the button in either room, either opposite room. So I have the cube. Gonna, we're going to escape any second now. There's the, the awkward wait. Then I need to get into this side over there. So we wait for it to change. We go through. Put it down. We try to run through. Oh, actually, we don't want to run through yet. Oh, no, we do. Yeah. There you go. I've played this game about 20 times. Um, still get things wrong. But you'll see now that door has opened. Something Portal uses as well are these um, lit up lines going across the ground. So if you follow these lines, they will actually like lead you to puzzle solutions. You can find out what they activate, what they trigger. Um, so again, level design, you can see those similarities with uh, Superliminal. And we can also see the differences. Right, We can see the difference in the world building. It's trying to create a very different type of environment to Superliminal. Um, it's using these, these boards as you enter the room. There is story going on. These cameras do link with the story as well. Um, and if we look at just one more level, um, and I'll take a drink while we go down in the lift. We can wait, wait, wait. And um, once we're here again, there we go. There's the load. I wasn't lying. Um, and once we're down there, we can. that used to be about a minute on old computers as well back in 2004. Um, so we'll see this screen isn't lit. So let's say we're looking over here as the player 
towards these portals because like that's eye catching. That looks cool. You'll see it flickers in while we're still in its view. I can only show you that once. The idea is it, it's trying to catch your eye. So two out of nineteen. Got a camera here again. So open, not yet. So now, because again, we've got to wait as a player. So level design again, this door didn't open for a while. If we pretend I wasn't rambling on, um, there's nowhere else to go, right? There's nowhere else to go. So you look down and you see this gun. You see a swivel and then shoot a portal. And the orange portal will change what it links to. So you'll see that this exists. As we come down here, you see these two lines, which now create a portal. That was very well timed. Um, so every portal that can be made on a wall here, excuse me, is drawn between these two lines. Then we can look around down here um, through these portals, see where we can go. Um, so yeah, that is. Um, I will. I'll leave it at that point for you. Um, but this is this is portal and super liminal just to get a comparison between the two to show you the kind of levels that are on offer. So now we've got the portal gone. Hop through. Um you can go anywhere with these portals now. Well you can go anywhere uh, that's orange at least. And then we go through. But I won't go in there because we'll get a load screen. So we've looked at two games there that have a lot of similarities and a split by two decades. Um, we've looked at some of the principles they use in terms of level layout, drawing the player's eye, using lighting to emphasize certain features, and using details in the environment like these, these strips, these bars, in order to um, inform the player on what to do. So we um, quit out of Portal. We hop into our Unreal Engine, which... Should just pop up any second now. Bear with me, minor technical difficulties. Okay, let me just um, tweak this. So um, what we are looking at at this point is um, how do we actually turn these games from being, you know, were very well produced, developed games that, we might not necessarily know how to create, right? We, we don't know the details, the theory behind how these games are made. Um, how do we convert them? Oh, I've gone from, um, just bear with me one moment. How do we convert them from um, AAA games into a game of our own design, our own making that we can actually go in and make modifications in? We can come up uh, with our own ideas. We can implement our own ideas. Um, turn them into games that you could potentially, you know, hop online and sell. You could put on a marketplace, you could make money from, um, and you could do, you know, very successful things with. Now, if I um, just get my Unreal Engine to behave and display, there we go. I'll scroll down right to the bottom. There we are. So um, what we are looking at now is the Unreal Engine. So... Um, So oh, on the Unreal Engine, um, just to give you a quick overview of what it actually is, um, we are able to develop games from the code that makes games run to the levels that we, we can physically build in Unreal Engine and all of the logic, rules, behavior, so on and so forth um, that you would expect to see in a game. Now, this is um, what we call a, a piece of, of starter content. This is the first-person template for Unreal where we can just hop in and um, play around in the game. Now, you're going to um, see the first person, like sort of test view, where we can run around in our game. We can jump. We can do a few things without even writing a line of code. It's all pre-built for us. Now, I'm going to turn my computer volume down just a little, um, and I'm going to shoot this bullet. There we go. Can you imagine how loud that would be on full volume? So um, you can also shoot bullets, knock the cubes around, you know, play about with the physics um in the game um but that's not what we're here to focus on today what we're actually here to focus on are the skills in unreal to turn this into a bit of a level we've designed ourselves so um a two minute overview of the unreal ui is as follows 
on the left hand side we have this place actors section this is where we can actually just grab some basic primitive shapes and put them in our game we can grab lights we can put lighting in our game so when we're talking about super liminal and its use of that lamp we can actually put like a lamp type light in our game if we want um cinematics any visual effects geometry which is what we're going to look at today um to a degree um and then we get a bit fancier with like volumes um and then everything that we want to have in here which is a big big list of things that'll take a while to learn um, but the main things we'll look at for today are basic lights and geometry in the middle we actually have our um template view or you know work in progress level view and at the top you'll see that there are a few options up here for what we can change what we can toggle the one you will click the most i'm sure is the play button to just test your game so whenever you make changes you hit play test it out um there is a mode section as well this is where and we're not going to go into this today but this is where you can create a landscape foliage if you want to add you know bushes and trees and flowers you want to sort of add you know a big land uh, that's got like grass textures and mud and soil textures concrete um you can do all of that in unreal as well so that's all handled within unreal um so yeah that's that's the the mode section where you can put those in i say we won't look at them for today on the right hand side this is our world outliner now um, one of the more common questions about Unreal is, well, what's the difference between place actors and world outliner? They both just look like objects. The difference is place actors gives you things that you can add to your level. So these are like templates, right, that you can like copy and paste over into your level, make copies of. The world outliner shows you what's already in your level, what's already been placed in a level. So we have this very, very exciting, you know, cubes folder in our world outliner that just has about... 13 cubes and f 14 cubes and if we double click each cube um i know it's exhilarating as we double click each cube and go around you'll see that it just um yeah takes us to each cube as we go whereas over here on the cube if we double click it it doesn't do anything because we'd actually have to drag our cube into the world in order to add it and then it gets added as cube very excitingly named um so that's sort of like the difference between place actors and world outliner here. World outliner has everything in your current level. Place actors is just like templates you can add into the game. Now, when we click on any of our objects here, and this is really important for level design, when we click on any of these, you'll see the details window in this bottom right. So the details section will change ever so slightly. Um, most data will be the same, especially on all of our cubes. They will be identical. If I go to light sources, it will change a little bit because lights do different things to cubes. Um, but the main things we're going to look at today, because again, if we scroll down here, there are quite a lot of sections that we're just going to ignore for today. Um, the bits we want to focus on and emphasize are um, transform, static mesh, and materials on the right-hand side. Now, transform comes in generally um, three flavors, location, rotation, and scale. So any object, I mean, you take my you know bottle of water that I've got here, um, in our actual world, in reality, um, this must have a position in the world, right? It's gotta have a position, it's gotta be somewhere if it exists. So this is its position. Um, going horizontally, it's got its X position. Going from sort of like far away and close, it's got its Y position. And then its height up and down is its Z position. Then it needs a rotation. So the bottle here is different to the bottle here, right? Or the bottle here or the bottle here. Um, it's in the same place. You know, if you imagine I'm holding, I can't, but if you imagine I was holding it in the dead center, then, you know, I could rotate it in any direction. So its rotation values determine the angle that it's at, the rotation it's at. And then finally, scale. Now, I can't do this. Um, but if I could just make this bottle of water bigger, I would be increasing its scale. If I wanted to just make it taller, I would just be increasing its Z uh, scale. If I wanted to make it bigger overall, I would increase all of its scales for an example. So um, in here, da, 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 da. and also, uh, Michael, that is yeah, really, really good point on the wait time um, in Portal 2. Portal 2 as well is a game I recommend maybe even more strongly than Portal 1, but play one before 2. Um, both fantastic games, and they go really, really, really cheap on sale. 
Um, if you're interested in level design, the Portal games are, you know, some of the best level designers of their time, um, being given a lot of time and freedom to just make their own game exactly how they wanted to. And it really, really does show in, in the Portal games. Um, um, and Portal 2 has Stephen Merchant in it, who's just great. So um, looking at our values, our transform uh, values, we have this location, rotation, and scale. Now, if I go and grab my cube, hello, my cube, I created you, um, we can test these. So in location, um, if I just click this little green arrow and drag it, you'll see the green value down here, our Y value, changes from 300 to wherever I put it. Right, That's its location. Same for the red value, same for the blue value. Now, I can click in the middle as well and drag it all around, and you'll see all three values change at the same time. Then I can either, up here in the top right of our preview, I can either click these buttons to toggle, or I can press W for location, E for rotation, R for scale. And then here I can actually rotate the cubes, and you'll see that X rotation has changed to minus 30 can rotate it on the Z, so on and so forth. So again, this is going to be a very hokey way of doing it. But, um, you know, if you want like spinnable pickups in your game that just slowly rotate, you can have them rotate like this. So that, again, it's eye-catching to the player. The player knows they can pick them up. Um, and then finally, scale. So we can grab one angle um, or one dimension, I should say, if we wanted. Or we can grab the very center gizmo and we can scale it proportionally. So it just becomes a bigger cube rather than a cuboid, and we can shrink it right down as well. So um, there are all the ways we can change our cube scale, but we shall delete that cube for now because we've got, we've got enough cubes in here, I think. These are enough. If I click one of these pre-existing cubes, the uh, last thing you'll see, and again, we won't go into this too much, but is mobility. So um, objects in Unreal have like three basic physics settings. Static is they just sit there and they can't be changed in game. They're never going to move. They're never going to go anywhere. Um, static movable or stationary is um, where you can change objects in game, but you can't actually move them around still. But you can have things like you know light hitting them, reflecting through them. Um, if you're walking around them with a, uh, a torch, sorry, then the cube shadows and how the light falls across it will change. And then movable. And this is an object that can be completely moved, thrown about in game, etc. So you know the way I was shooting these cubes. If I where's our player? Yeah, our player's aiming at that cube. Um, if I run the game now and shoot this cube, I can knock it about, it'll fly into the cube behind it, knock that one about. I change this to static and I click play. Uh, now you'll see the projectiles actually bounce off it and it doesn't move. So it's immune to physics, it's static. Um Static is much, much cheaper on the CPU. It's much, much cheaper on the computer. So your performance won't suffer as much, but movable, as you've just seen, gives a lot more uh, potential and flexibility in there. So static mesh. This is going to be strange because I've just used the word cube a thousand times. But in static mesh, if you click a drop down here, this is with starter content on. You'll see a whole bunch of objects, a whole bunch of shapes. So if I were to click cylinder, for example, in static mesh, it's the cube is now a cylinder. It'll still be called editor cube. We'd have to rename it, um, you know, just here. Um, but yeah, it's it's now a cylinder that you know if we wanted this to be like a pipe, for example, we could um, you know put it there or like a pillar in a room. Um, our pillar in a room. There we go. We did it. Um, game developers. So um, yeah, these just allow you to access any of the meshes you've got in your game. If you want to use 3D modeling software to make some complex meshes, which mesh, just think of it as like the object, as like the, the skeleton for an object, right? The shape of something. Um, you can go into here and yeah, you can get like, you know, sort of pipe sections um, to link them together, et cetera, and any objects that you've created. We'll delete that cube as well. Um, get these cubes scared. Now, if I go to another cube, let's just grab this big one here. Um, we've looked at mesh. We've looked at transform. In materials now, if we click the drop down, um, in our starter content, and again, you can go and create your own of materials if you want. That's another whole area in Unreal. Um, we can actually access a whole bunch of, bunch of materials. So this is the appearance. If the mesh is the shape of something, um, the material is, is how it looks, right? It's like the texture. It's the art. 
So if I just type, for example, let's say chrome, because I know it's in there, um, I'm cheating, you'll see this metal chrome material. You give that a click, and now the cube is metallic. If I grab another cube, go into a material, and I type wood, uh, we got actually a bunch of wood. Uh, let's go for pine. Let's go for pine wood. So I play the game now. Look at our cubes. You'll see this wood um, looks just like pine, right? We definitely all know what pine looks like. I haven't got a clue. Um, and this one is metallic. And you'll see it even has like reflections. It's reflecting our gun. We don't have a player model, so it's just the gun reflecting. Um, but you'll see like how the light plays across it, etc. So again, if you wanted to make changes, if you wanted to create a certain effect or, or visual for the player, you can you can do this through materials quite often. So now that we've looked at all the the main features of objects in our level um, and, and you know how to sort of modify them a little, let's look at how we could actually start to create a level because this is all pre-made, right? So I'm going to actually um, delete all of our cubes. I'm going to delete this wall. And I'm going to delete this wall. So um, ignore this. Um, this is because lighting isn't fully rebuilt at the moment. Uh, I'm not going to rebuild it because it has a little bit of a wait time. So um, I don't, I don't want to have downtime in here. But um, going into our game, um, we've now got a completely empty environment. It's just a player, four walls, and a floor. So going into our basic objects. We could grab a cube, drag it over, use our W key to get into the uh, location settings, and then we could go into our scale key to actually change the size of this. And instead of being a cube, we now made it a wall. I'm you know doing this very sort of sort of quick and and simplistic. But, you know, depending on what you wanted, I'll just line that up roughly. Um, depending on what you wanted to achieve in your game, what you wanted to design, um, you know, you could sort of make irregularly shaped walls. You could sort of have, you know, um, different levels, different types of walls, different uh, sorts of like stories in a building as well, if you wanted. Um, and let's just say, say this isn't quite flush and we want it to be flush. And there's two things you can do here. First off, we have this perspective button in our preview, and you can actually change this perspective and, and prepare your eyes for this. Uh, if I click, say, front, you'll see you'll get like a wireframe straight out of the matrix type setting. But if I zoom in, you can see my gizmo and the wireframes for all the shapes and models, and we can see this gap. Look, at it, isn't that terrible? So what we can do in our wireframe view is adjust the, uh, the location. So what you'll see is it's actually snapping past it. We can't get it to fit flush. And that's because up here in our settings for location, we've set it to 10 pixels. So if I drop this to five pixels or even one, let's do it to one, I can drag it by such a smaller margin. And you'll see there we've got it uh, pretty much flush. I think we could go down one more, but um, we'll leave it there because I, I end up sort of like obsessively tweaking things. But yeah, you'll see how close that is now. That will do. That's not too noticeable. Now, if this is our wall and we're happy with it, what we can actually do is select it and press Control W to duplicate it. So, you know, I see people quite often sort of like creating the same wall eight times, doing it step by step. It's like, no, just press Control W. Life gets a lot easier. Um, so, yeah, you can duplicate. Now, let's say we want a, a wall off here. We could press E for rotate, and we can drag it round to 90 degrees. And then we've got this wall. Um, and let's say we want this to be a much longer wall. So we can do that. So if I run the game now, you'll see, um, you know, these walls automatically come into being. We could probably, like, if this is the doorway, you know, you'd want a little, little wall, um, so to speak, just bridging that gap. Um, but you know, we've got what would be a room at this point. We could add objects, we could add enemies, we could add interactions, so on and so forth. And let's just imagine, let's imagine, um, if you bear with me a quick second, we're gonna we're gonna get crazy. Um, let's 90 degrees that. Let's drag this ceiling up and let's size. 
So what I'm doing now is putting a roof on, and this roof is actually going to block um, light sources out. So if I play, uh, the size is like it's crazy kind of. So hang, but you'll see this room is is a lot darker now. So let's imagine over in this part of the room we were going to place a, a special object, and I shall mark that object with just like a cylinder. Um, let's go into movements. So let's say this cylinder is going to be a podium that has my portal gun on it. It has my key to escape the level on it. Well, what we could actually do is if we go into our place actor settings and we go to lights, um, we have several different types of lights. And again, lighting is like a whole thing. Um, but we'll we'll just use a, a basic light for now, a spotlight. And a spotlight is exactly what you, you might assume. It is a light um, that illuminates a spot. Uh, that's 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 genuinely uh, you know what it is so i'm going to align this um roughly i could go into wireframe again and make it sort of precise but we'll leave it as it is here now you'll see oh uh, you'll see this cone and you'll see the way the light falls so if i play there's two ways we can actually read and understand the light here um because it's not we haven't added a model we haven't added you know a light model um we've just added the light which just casts light but you'll be able to see around the cylinder we have the shadow and if if i may say so myself i've got it very very close to being in the middle uh, that ooh, that's not a comment on my level of course no one would ever say that um that's just where the word preview is written because this light is a preview you'll see in the top left it says lighting needs to be rebuilt but we'll ignore that for now um that's where you normally click that button and you go make a drink um and hope it's done when you get back so in this room now, we can sort of see this side of the room is quite a bit darker. This side has this illumination. And if we actually wanted on our light, um, using all of our light settings, we can actually like up the intensity by a lot. Um, we can change the attenuation radius. So if you think of that as like how far the light goes, how far it gets thrown. But we want it to reach the floor, so we'll, we'll put it down there. And then cone angles. So again, if you want a hyper-focused light, you can do this. Uh, you can make the angle much bigger if you um, want it. And then a middle cone for like the most vibrant like core of the light. So if I run now with that gigantic cone, you'll see how much brighter it is down this side. And again, that's a choice for you to make, right? And we could even set up like a trigger zone. So as you enter this room, you see, you know, our eye line, again, you walk in here, you can actually see this bit of the light. So if this light was off, and as the player enters, it comes on, it flickers on. Well, actually, that'd be quite cool because the player would be looking, you know, at it peripherally. They'd see it and look and go, oh, look, that's cool. Piece of candy. Um, and again, this side is dark. Um, an example of another light, a point light, is like just a, your typical bulb. Um, if I just add that just generally to the side, it kind of lights up every surface around it, you know, just in, in like a sphere. It casts light evenly in all directions, whereas the spotlight, you'll see this kind of arc where, you know, that cone is getting, um, it, it's sort of ending as the light comes down. That's the difference between two types of light. And then the only question you'd really ask yourself at this point is, what kind of level do you want to make? What is it that, you know, you would like to achieve in this? Um, what would your goals be? And one of your the best bit of advice i can give you there and this is something that you'll hear me say a billion and one times um on the course if you choose it is always design for the player and you can be that player because if you're working on games design it's it's a safe bet that you like games and you've played games so think about what a player wants it's not always correct for a designer to say i like this or i think this is good so i'm doing it think very carefully i just realized my webcam covers some of the transform um, values but um yeah so think carefully about what does a player want um what will a player enjoy what will suit a player in in your game in your environment okay um let me just grab these two drag them down here um just to show you one last time if i click on one of my walls you'll see the transform tools on the right hand side location rotation scale and if I move the transform, you'll see that Z-axis changes. If I move this way, you'll see the Y-axis changes, so on and so forth. So um, there are values in our static mesh and our materials. So 
Um, that's the core. The other thing I wanted to show you, uh, which we'll wrap up with, is our geometry. So you can add cubes and just reshape them into walls and, and do some of the basic stuff like that that you want. Now, here's the cool thing about geometry. This is used for what we call blocking out. This is if you're never going to actually turn this into a real level, right? If function is just like a cube, we're just adding a box. Um, but if I just make this box a lot bigger, it's going to be quite a simple box um, and drag it to this corner. Um, we can use geometry for what we call additive and subtractive um, modeling or environment building. So this block exists. This box is just here, right? But if we look on the right, the settings are slightly different. There's no material. There's no mesh. We can't do anything with it. We can't change the shape of it um, other than, you know, basic resizing, etc. And we can't make it look like anything. We can't make it look chrome or wooden or anything like that. But this brush type, where it says additive, we can change the subtractive. Now, if I change the subtractive right now, it's just going to vanish. It's just going to be an outline, and that's it. Uh, we don't want that. But what we can do is if I um, drag another box in here, um, roughly in the middle, like that. And let's just use the scale tool to make it a lot longer. Probably way too long, but it doesn't matter. Um, now it's just now it's just like a, a cube with a little cube on the end of it. But if I change this cube to be, um, oh, wait, wait, wait. if I change this cube to be subtractive, then suddenly we've got a corridor. Um, is that going to be high enough for the player? Yeah. So suddenly we've got a corridor that we can walk down. It goes nowhere, obviously. Um, but you can use geometry to create like those sorts of avenues, etc. And that that's much faster than you know making three cubes, etc. We could have done this for our doorway. We could have made this a geometry wall and put a subtractive door-shaped cube um, or box in here as well. Um, there's a lot more you can do with geometry, reshaping it, etc. We can also add stairs. So. You know, we can add a staircase uh, very, very easily. Rotate that 90 degrees. And, um, yeah, you know, depending on what you want to do, right? I walk up those stairs. That might be a bit too high for our step size. Yeah, but, you know, you could still jump up um, and get on the roof. So, you know, again, that's something you can just play around with as a designer. And then you just want to think, yeah, what's good for the player? What will make the player enjoy this level? What will create a sense of exploration, discovery? How do we teach the player what to do? How do we teach the player that they can pick up the object on the plinth, that they can move with WASD, that they can shoot a bullet that can maybe destroy targets or activate you know, uh, platforms, buzzers, whatever it is that you want to do? Um, the main thing, though, honestly, the, the, the biggest priority, which is something you know I, I can't teach you, is to just hop into Unreal and play around. Mess about with the geometry tool. Um, mess about with all the shapes, your materials. Try and create an interesting environment. It doesn't even need any gameplay, first and foremost. It can just be an interesting environment. If there's a game you like, try to create a block out. So, you know, saying like the geometry, a block out, just putting the shapes in. No graphics, um, no gameplay. A block out of a level that you like. Maybe a level from Portal or Superliminal. Um, do that. Do that as an exercise. And there'll be two things you'll know at the end. First off, how challenging level design is. It's not just having a good idea. That's like day one. Everyone has a good idea. Um, and, you know, secondly, um, you, you'll have a better idea of, of if you want to do this, if you'd like to do this long term. Because, again, and I've, I've taught games design for 10 years. There's a big difference between liking the idea of doing games design and then actually doing games design. It is a skill. Um, it's part science, part art. It's challenging. It's difficult. Um, and you'll have a lot of hiccups, a lot of times where you just can't work something out, where you get stuck. Things don't make sense. You want to give up. Um, and you you have to just get stuck back in. You just have to like make yourself carry on. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of resilience in it. Um, so Get into Unreal, get on the software, play around with it, experiment, see how see how much you like the level design process and the thought process. So that is me done with my masterclass. Um, and I'm just going to open it up to anyone who has any questions that they would like to ask. Ooh, and uh, we'll come out to the game preview as well. 
Uh, so Stephen asks, how much does the software cost? Okay, so very, very good news. Uh, good news. Um, Unreal Engine is almost completely free. Now, for us, it is free. If you want to install the Epic Launcher right now and you want to go on and install the Unreal Engine in the Epic Launcher, you can do so. It won't cost you a penny. The only time you have to pay Epic for using the Unreal Engine is I think it's when you earn over a hundred thousand dollars or pounds. Um, if you've earned a hundred thousand, um, of whichever currency it is, then you know, I'd say you're probably in a position where you don't mind paying Epic for the software that you just made a hundred grand off of. So, Zoe asks, what, what skills would you need to be a level designer? That's a really good question. So in the field, um, in the industry, level designer is a standalone job. There are people who work as level designers full-time. It's a really valued skill. And one of the challenges of being a level designer is, as I said before, it's a science and an art. So it's understanding things like um, color theory, lighting, um, you know, the sort of quality of consistency between graphical assets. So that sounds super fancy, but you know, you've got to understand when you're designing a level to put objects in it, what are those objects going to look like? Uh, what kind of feel do you want to get from that level? Color theory means that, you know, different colors evoke different responses in us. It's almost like setting up film scenes, you know, for, for, for an actual um, film recording. Um, you're placing everything with intent. You're trying to create a, a response in a player. Even if it is like super liminal, an empty room with a table, you're putting that table somewhere that's going to have maximum effect. And they do that by, you know, putting it in eye line of the door and as it opens with you standing on the button. And, you know, that, that all adds up. It all comes together. Um, and then, um, yeah, the other side of it is the science side of things, which is level design does, you know, require a lot of technical know-how. You've got to know your way around. Not necessarily Unreal Engine, but you've got to know your way around game engines, 3D modeling tools, et cetera, um, and be able to, um, you know, set up some basic functionality. So if I actually, you know, was to do another hour and show you how you can, you know, put an item here that the player can walk into and pick up and it will trigger a light or, you know, lights will change or flicker or change color, et cetera, depend, you know, whatever it is you want to do. Maybe a red light turns green when you solve the puzzle. So, you know, you can go through the door. Um, that, that's all done in something we call blueprinting. And blueprinting, I will very, very quickly show you, um, is I actually really like it, but I know it can be a bit scary to people. This is blueprinting. So it, it's basically, it's like programming, right? And I, I won't dwell on this, but it's learning this process, which obviously we teach. Uh, we teach you how to use blueprints, how to set these up. And this is blueprint code to shoot the projectile. So when we left click, shoot the projectile. It, it also has VR support built in as standard. So we don't need any of that really. It just, it also comes with the starter um, project. So um, this is what blueprints are. So the other side of being a level designer is to know your way around a bit of basic programming or a bit of basic blueprinting. John asks, um, what game design courses do we do and where are we based? So um, we are based in Bootle, Merseyside, L27EW, um, Hubert College. And we deliver both FA and HE courses. So in games design specifically, we have a two-year level three BTEC that's called the Digital Creative Media Production Qualification. That's a very long name, um, but that's the official name. Um, we just call it digital development. So part of that is 3D modeling. Part of that is um, games development. So you learn programming you um, learn a bit of 3D modeling, you learn level design, you learn game design in general, because obviously there's a lot more to design than just level design. That's one aspect of, of a level uh, of uh, game development, because you've got you know rules, mechanics, story, etc. Um, a lot going on. Uh, balance is like a huge part of, of design, especially in multiplayer. Um, and then on the HE side of things, we run our games design foundation degree. So that is a two-year degree that you can then convert into what we call a top-up year, where you do one more year, and then you get a full degree. We're partnered with UCLan, which means we run the exact same modules that UCLan run. We sort of use the same you know, assignments generally um, that UCLan run. So you know, we, we have that like sort of like mutual support and, and access to resources. Um, and on your games design qualification, um, your, your degree in games design, you'll do a few things. You will 
Um, do more 3D modeling. So everything's at like a higher skill level at this point. 3D modeling, level design, general game design. So, you know, you'll look into, um, you know, rules, mechanics, balance, etc. cetera. Um, you'll also do a bit of art. So character design, drawing for design, illustration, so on and so forth. You actually make a board game at one point where you'll illustrate and develop the actual board game itself. Um, during COVID, we used Tabletop Simulator on Steam to do it, which was quite cool. But general years, you know, we we prefer to sort of make a physical board game. It's a bit more exciting to actually, you know, have a physical product in front of you. Um, so yeah, they they're the general topics on the course. Um and um for funding for the course, so the course is um H E qualification. So the typical route is to apply through student finance. Um, course fees are a thousand, um, I think, as they stand. Uh, some some courses may be eight thousand five hundred, but a bit cheaper than uh, most other universities. Um, and yeah, you would generally do that. That's per year. You would do that through um, student finance. Mia, good question. So when does the course start and can it be studied part-time? So yeah, the course starts every September. You can still apply through our um, college websites, hubert.ac.uk. Click apply now and then click university center and it will take you through to our like university courses. Just look for the um, foundation degree in games design there um, to check it out. And it can be studied part-time. Okay. Um, so you can um, do it over three years as a two-year qualification or four years if you do the top up year it's fine so um we're gonna wrap it up there folks uh, thank you very very much um for your time today hopefully you got something useful out of that even if you finish thinking i don't want to do that actually completely fine I'm, I'm glad you know you're informed going forward and anyone who is interested um feel free to email me you'll see the bottom right there um my email address, thomas.owens.hubert.ac.uk. Feel free to email with any questions. And if you are interested, you can always apply through the website, hubert.ac.uk. So thank you very much, folks, and goodbye. <laughs>